you know, we've always kind of run by the ethos, you know, don't spend what you don't have. And so the fact that we have raised, you know, less than $2 million in outside capital means that we've had to really figure it out ourselves. And that's, you know, goes from, like Sabrina said, the sales aspect to it, to, you know, farming and, um, you know, everything in between. Sabrina and Lex, welcome to the show. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. How are you? Yes. Doing awesome. Trying to uh, ignore the fact that it's been raining more than it's been sunny out here in Illinois during the summer from oh. from California. So good for the they, flowers. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, why don't we start off with you guys kind of just giving a background about yourselves, um, kind of what, what brought you to the industry and what you guys have been doing kind of up to the point of forming stone road cool um yeah so i started stone road in 2016 uh it's named after the first place that i ever grew cannabis which is in uh connecticut um kind of nearby where i grew up in new york city um and yeah we uh you know started growing there when i was just a, a little tot and um you know have just been kind of you know working in uh the you know, the cannabis industry, um, you know, pretty much since 2009, um, you know, bought my farm in California in 2016, launched uh, on the shelves in April of 2017, um, and have been building ever since. Cool. Thanks, Lex. And yes, I'm Sabrina. So originally, I started in the health and wellness industry, specifically focusing on sports nutrition and Ayurvedic herbs, which was a perfect segue for me into cannabis. So I actually moved out to California two weeks after cannabis went recreational in California. So January 14, 2018, and just dove in head first. And I've held most positions within the industry from soups to nuts, but most notably helped grow Old Pal from their infancy, worked for them for a little over two and a half years, and then joined Stone Road originally as director of national brand expansion and um, then moved into serving as their COO. Awesome. Uh, where did you come from prior to California? Massachusetts. Oh, Massachusetts. Right. Side of both, the both you guys. East Coast. Yes. <laughs> you like uh, California better than the East Coast or Miss Home? I like the West Coast weather and the East Coast people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can see that. It's kind of the same out here in the Midwest. Yes, it's exactly. The good weather, but definitely the people are a little easier to stomach sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about Stone Road. What's going on uh, with you guys? I, I keep seeing more and more stuff. It seems like you guys are super busy. Um, you're all over the place, uh, getting a lot of good coverage. So tell me about what's been going on and kind of what's in the near future. So we've been kind of since our infancy, we've been focused on like a multi-prong kind of approach to kind of retail penetration in cannabis. So in California, we grow, um, you know, a lot of our own flour ourselves, do a lot of our own manufacturing. We are, um, you know, we have our own farm in Northern California, Northern California in a, in a town called Nevada City. Um, so we've just been steadily increasing, you know, our capacity at the farm to you know, kind of match the demand that we see in, in California. And then um, in other states, we've taken a licensing approach um, to getting the brand on the shelves. Um, you know, our first launch was in Oklahoma, followed by Massachusetts, more recently Michigan. Um, and as Sabrina alluded to, we are uh, really close to launching in New Mexico. And then we have a bunch more East Coast states lined up after that. Busy, busy. You, Sabrina, yeah. you're the one on the road all the time or... Both you guys, or how's that work? Yeah, definitely running around. We're a duo. Yeah. <laughs> Dynamic duo. We're still awesome. a two-person team, so we're doing yeah. it all ourselves, awesome. which, which is great. You know, it has it, its perks, but also we're definitely both workaholics. <laughs> it's such a different approach than um, pretty much all the other companies. Like, you guys are such a small team, and you're really leveraging – external partners uh very successfully obviously um which is really cool because i think that a lot of companies struggle with sort of the corporate bloat and trying to figure out how they're going to pay for uh you know non-revenue producing stuff and it seems like you guys have figured out a pretty solid way of 
bypassing a lot of that what's what's been kind of your secret um to figuring that out in a way that you're still able to manage all the stuff you need to manage so i would say i'll i'll start this one off and lex i know you have some thoughts on this too but you know it's been a lot of trial and error you know both of us have worked with big teams and small teams and kind of been able to find like the secret sauce you know it's like mm -hmm. For us, for example, even though we're a two-person team, like we do outsource all of our admin work to overseas admins, which is just, you know, astronomically less expensive than domestic. And also it's like, yeah. you know, especially for sales, you know, it's like Lax and I have these really strong relationships and, you know, a lot of the most time consuming things are, you know, sending out weekly emails, like you know, in putting orders and whatnot. So being able to utilize this overseas team for all of that, you know, less strategic work. So we can really focus on, you know, building relationships, opening new states and all the stuff that takes more of that high level, you know, strategy is definitely, you know, worked in our favor, but, you know, it's like, working with different companies and seeing how overstaffed and also understanding that it's like payroll is the most one of the most expensive costs running a business so being able to really like as you said streamline it so you know we're only hiring revenue producing positions has definitely been key especially in this climate of cannabis lex yeah yeah no i mean i i agree uh, wholeheartedly it's just it's about um, you know, keeping things lean and mean right now. Um, you know, margins are notoriously slim in cannabis because of, you know, competition from the legal market, from the traditional market. The tax structure is is not friendly, um, you know, to license holding or even ancillary businesses. So, um, you know, we've always kind of run by the ethos, you know, don't spend what you don't have. And so the fact that we have raised, you know, less than $2 million in outside capital means that we've had to really figure it out ourselves. And that's, you know, goes from, like Sabrina said, the sales aspect to it, to, you know, farming and, um, you know, everything in between. Yeah. And it's, I mean, even payroll is one of the biggest components of most businesses, but I think it, with a 280 uh, burdened business like cannabis, it's that much more devastating because you can't even uh, deduct those expenses from your taxes. And so you're literally paying taxes on the taxes of the payroll and everything in between so um yeah yeah i imagine that's probably a huge cost savings for you guys um, yeah yeah awesome uh lex you said something a little bit earlier that caught my attention you said you're increasing capacity to meet demand which is, in this industry is almost unheard of uh <laughs> why don't you talk about that a little bit that's really that's really a smart approach but i, I don't feel like a lot of people look at it that way so tell me about that yeah, so we have over the years utilized different co-packing groups to basically bring our products to market. And then as we saw, you know, a number of issues specifically pertaining to quality control, consistency, we've over the past five years have just been bringing more and more in-house because there's just, there's nothing like controlling the supply chain, um, you know, from soup to nuts. It's like from the actual packaging to the raw product to inputs um you know the more you control the more you can one cut down on costs and two just make sure that the end product is something that you know you can be really proud of so you know we started with making like well when we really started in medical days we were producing everything uh in-house and then as we weren't able to uh, attain a cultivation license because of an ordinance uh, in our county and we weren't able to attain a manufacturing license because it was cost prohibitive um you know we we moved to this co-packing model didn't work um and then we've just been basically making more and more stuff uh in-house um and we find the quality goes up um you know our costs go down and so ultimately having more control over the products we bring to market has led to an increase in demand for those products. So where, you know, before we might have been only growing, you know, 20, 30, 40% of the products that we sell at the farm recently, a, a license change in the County allows us to, to increase the growable square footage. Um, so mm -hmm. where I think last year we grew about 50% of the product that we pushed out 
we hope as we continue to grow like our total revenue, we can also grow uh, our percentage of products made in house. Nice. I, I assume that's primarily speaking towards the California market where you guys are based out of with your expansion markets. Uh, it seems like one of the main strengths you guys have had is being able to identify and leverage quality partners. Um, I agree with you though. Like even in my experience, um, you know, with the expansion markets so for Steezy, we had endless uh, issues with, you know, some of the co-packing partners and, and co-manufacturing partners because, you know, whether it was because they didn't have matured operations or they just didn't listen and follow SOPs or whatever it was, they just don't never care about your product usually as much as you. Um, but what have you guys been able to do to mitigate that in these expansion markets so that you can try to keep a, uh, your quality, you know, within that range that you find acceptable. So there's not that huge discrepancy, like some of these other brands that are out there, right. Where you look at their product, wherever they're from, and that's what builds the reputation. Then you try it in an expansion market and it's nothing like that. And kind of a lot of people, that's their first impression, right? Right. I yeah. feel like having very dialed in SOPs and also it's like when we're in, you know, talks with, new partners it's like we also go we visit their facility we meet with their team and we figure out what their strengths are if we know mm -hmm. there's a we have that would be way too complicated for them or they don't have experience producing that skew it's like we're not going to lean into that one and mm -hmm. so aside from that just having very detailed sops from sourcing to production has been very helpful and for us it hasn't been so much of a problem on keeping that consistent quality as it is keeping our products in stock in each state. And obviously with fluctuating flower prices and, you know, just newer markets feeling, you know, that experience their first like wave of like turnover and, you know, all the nuances of starting up a new industry in a new state um, is definitely more the challenge than just, you know, having consistent quality. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's, that's basically it. You know, you can hope and pray as much as you want, but ultimately you're not there on the ground. And so, um, you know, what you're saying is like, you know, the, the quality will vary, um, but it's ultimately about just choosing partners that, you know, will put, you know, the best available biomass in your product and, um, you know, a little bit of luck and, yeah, I mean, we we deal with the same issues with either, you know, partners not really listening or partners not even listening, but just not believing what we're saying. Um, you know, and obviously we don't say anything because we're trying to scare, uh, you know, our partners. We just want to be realistic around where each respective market is heading, even in limited license markets, because as more people come online, more canopy prices dropping, yada, yada um and so it's like we've just seen this show so many times yeah. and so for us you know basically telling um groups okay these are xyz ways to mitigate um you know a price collapse you know and a lot of right. times as um you know brands uh a price collapse on the wholesale market can actually be good for us but the problem is that brands and cpg products are really tricky where a lot of these groups still make the vast majority of their, their money selling bulk flour. And so when the bulk flour selling market, it for $3,500 a pound, <laughs> right? It's, it's easy to make the pro forma look good when you're selling it for, yeah, yeah $3,500, $4,000 in a newer pound. Right. But you know, when the market drops to, you know, 12 to 1500, you know, it's an entirely different story. Um, and so we're starting to see that, you know, with, with partners, you know, they're, they're wanting to get more lean, um, you know, just generally more, um, cost efficient and you know we're there when when they want us to be to um you know help push them in the right direction but you know people uh pe people aren't great listeners all the time so you know we can hope and pray but ultimately you know they'll come to us when they're ready it's interesting um what you guys are talking about because i was interviewing uh john lafada from uh, big oil co couple weeks ago and you know he's coming from sort of the co-production side uh of of that sort of coin and what he was talking about was how he has to similarly as a good partner sort of train the brands on things like inventory management and uh you know quality control and stuff like that right because they're often coming in without that knowledge and running themselves into the ground 
Uh, so it's interesting to hear from your guys because you're actually doing that the opposite direction. It sounds like you're going in as the brand and kind of providing this guidance to some of these newer operators in these emerging markets, right? And because you're from California, it's like a, a lot of times it is like a time machine. You already know what's going to happen. You've seen it, like you said, a ton of times. And uh, it's funny how every single market comes online and people think it's going to be <laughs> different and don't just realize it's exactly the same pattern over and over again. What uh, what would you say outside of like sort of controlling for quality and inventory, what has been the biggest challenge for you guys um, sort of as a brand, as an, as an operator, what have you? In California, it's definitely the AR issue and just credit uh, issues in terms of stores, either placing large purchase orders to use that cash for internal cost, uh, you know, operations or for actual expansion. Um, yeah. And, you know, I joke like we're not a bank, you know, we're not offering 0% interest loans here, but I feel like a lot of partners think we are. And so, um, you know, ultimately figuring out, uh, you know, who's worth it to do business with and, um, you know, the payment issues in California is as, as kind of, CEO and like head bookkeeper uh, is definitely what keeps me up at night the most, uh, just that there's a lot of parties who owe us, you know, tens of thousands, if not low hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and, you know, it really impacts, um, you know, it, it impacts every, it impacts every aspect of our operation, whether it's payroll or paying operators or packaging or R and D and being able to launch new products because we're, you know, spending so much time on AR and it's just like, you know, neither Sabrina and I, or I don't think any human being on this planet likes doing <laughs> AR. Um, so it's like, you know, I live by the credence, like if you owe someone something, pay them. And I hate yeah. being in, so it, it's kind of a intellectual yeah. disconnect for me that all these people are just like holding on to these massive debts and, and not paying. Yeah. It's a, and that when you're the bridge and you have the good habits on paying, but you're receiving payments super late, it really puts a strain on your cash flow too, more so than folks that just pass that continuously down the chain. So it's definitely tough. What are you guys our, doing? Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say like our industry too. It's like, you know, it's even if these people don't pay, it's like, we're still on the hook for paying the distro, right. for get it delivered, paying our manufacturers. It's like, we, you know, we can't be late on payments. Otherwise the business stops where these retailers, it's like yeah. they can't just go buy from a new brand or a brand they haven't worked with before and, you know, load up on their products and do the same thing. And it's this really like repetitive cycle. It's like Rob Peter to pay Paul, you know, every single day. I can't believe I haven't been in the California market since 2020 and yet nothing has changed. <laughs> it is exactly what used to happen. I was, I was the one it wasn't my job, but I would just like snatch the phone from the accounting team and like start yelling at people because it gets really frustrating when you've tried to reach them 20 times and you just send someone out to their shop and they're like, oh, they're not here. You know, they're there. You see their car, they're there, but they're just like literally skipping out. So that's tough. I think it's funny. Like, so last week we actually went to, we were dealing with like this exact situation. There was an account that owes an invoice from almost two years ago. And we went to the shop. We both show up in person, 8 a.m. right when they open. <laughs> and we had a sign and we were going to stand out there that said, shop name does not pay their farmers. Oh, and finally, we got them to cash us out on the spot for all the invoices they owed, which is like crazy. Also, the fact that it took getting to that point. It's like we've sent them yeah. to clouds. We've like, you know, called them, emailed them, texted them every yes. For like the past year and a half and it's like it took that to finally yeah. get payment but um anyway i thought that was funny and it just happened, so had to funny share and sad it. at the same time <laughs> Very. So, yeah. yeah so what do you what Whatever do you guys do now kind of do you have some sort of like a credit earning system or are you only taking cash on delivery from most new people or what, how are you guys doing it cod is obviously preferable but a lot of people aren't super keen on that. So now we're just vetting our partners a little bit more carefully to make sure that, um, you know, their likelihood to pay is over 90% where before it was like much more of a revenue game and everyone was after like 
the elusive investor dollars and was kind of willing to pump sales no matter what, even if they kind of knew or maybe thought that maybe they weren't going to get paid where now it's yeah. like, if we, if we think we're not going to get paid, like we're not delivering, you know, it's different and, when it's your money than somebody else's money too, I'd imagine. Exactly. Yeah. And also limiting how many orders they can get without paying. It. It's like, you know, now we're really moving towards people upon their next order. They have to close out yeah. their last voice, which people before were like five and six invoices yeah. deep still getting. If you order. need another order, that means you sold your product, which means you have the money yeah. to pay for this. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that we implemented well, we that hope. at Steezy. You couldn't get a new order. So you pay your old order first, uh, very simple. That's how it should be. And in most yeah. industries, that's how it is. If it's not COD, you know, it's it's bananas that people just don't get that. Yeah. It was interesting in Michigan because everyone was on LeafLink for the most part. So they had, I know things kind of changed a little bit, a little more recently when the market really was struggling. But for a long time there, everyone was on LeafLink Financial. So LeafLink was kind of taking on that brunt of the, bridging uh you know and they dealt with the collection so as nice as a as a, a producer and, and a seller of goods because we didn't really have to worry about the same stuff that was happening in california and i remember entering the market and like that was the one thing i was dreading so much was the endless ar calls um and not having to do that was definitely a, a positive so hopefully you guys get the rest of your money and uh people start wising up a little bit i think there's a lot of vocalization now in the industry you know on linkedin on instagram kind of uh, between operators and stuff starting to call folks out that are doing this like particularly heinously so mm -hmm. hopefully that gets people motivated to pay their bills a little better where do you see the industry going in five years i i ask this question because i feel like a lot of times people that are not in the industry discuss this and it's a lot of speculation from folks that don't necessarily have insider information. So I'm much more interested in hearing from people actually operating uh, what they think, you know, we're headed and are we going to, do you think we're going to legalize um, at the federal level, banking, et cetera? Where's your head at on that? I, oh, I hope so. Go first. Yeah, a lot of thoughts here. You know, I do think eventually, you know, it will be federally legalized whether it's within the next five years, we hope so, but um, that's, that's kind of a gamble. But the one thing I'm seeing is, so we're talking to a lot of international partners as well. And I think it's really interesting that, for example, we're talking to this group in Portugal and they're already being able to import flour from Colombia, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think, and Germany as well. And so I think as other countries really start to dial in their process and they show, you know, these more like successful, you know, paths that, you know, hopefully the U.S. will follow suit and, you know, we can also kind of implement some of these things because it's, you know, for example, it's like, you know, obviously weed grown in California is going to be astronomically better than, you know, weed grown in Vermont simply because of the climate. And so being able to, you know, uh, move product, you know, across the country definitely will be a huge advantage for farmers and brands. But, you know, I know first federal legalization has to happen. So that's kind of the gamble here. But, you know, really hopeful that kind of with some of these international models that, you know, we, we will be able to pick up some of the, the things that are working well for them. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with pretty much the uh, the global move towards like a federal legalization. I do think that puts some external pressures on uh, the U.S. to keep up. And what I'm really interested, what I'm really interested to see personally is like how co countries like Colombia that have such a lower cost of labor and materials and everything else, as they start ramping up like their biomass in particular, right? Like uh, maybe not, maybe I don't, I'm not super familiar with their climate and how that affects cannabis, but, uh, so maybe, I don't know if they can grow top shelf outdoor weed, but they can definitely grow biomass. And, you know, once things legalize and we're able to import and export, it'll be very interesting to see how that affects the operators out here who are growing like for distillate or, uh, even live resin and stuff like that. Don't you think? Oh, totally. And I actually just read that Columbia right now has, 
um, I think the biggest cannabis cultivation center, like to the point where they could supply other countries. And I read an article and it was, it was, you know, written by a U.S. writer and they were like, oh, this is going to be horrible for the industry because, you know, they're going to be able to supply all the U.S., which quite frankly isn't true. And as you said, I don't think the climate is, you know, perfect enough for top shelf flour, but I do think that would be great, you know, for options of, you know, making distillate extracts. And like, you know, it's like right now, like trim is in the biggest shortage, you know, that it's ever experienced and, you know, people are, you know, paying top dollar right now for trim just to make distillate. So I think it would be, you know, kind of helpful for everyone if, you know, in the future, that is the case where we can import some of, some of their flour, but it definitely will be interesting to see, but I mean, they definitely have a lot of space and a lot of cultivation facilities coming online. Oh yeah. Lex, what are your thoughts? Five years. I mean, the obvious hope is that it's federally legal, uh, by then if not i'm going to be very very tired um <laughs> you know but ultimately it's it's there's a lot uh there's a lot hanging in the balance you know there's you know we don't need federal le legalization for our business to make sense but it would make it a whole lot easier um you know regulatory wise uh tax framework wise and so you know, for us, um, it's just making sure that we're running a business that's generating free cash flow and 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 you know a basic amount of EBITDA. And um, you know, once we kind of have those things, we're just kind of growing organically. You know, we um, you know are getting into more states, more deals, uh, more diverse revenue streams. And so for us, it, it, it is going to be a long haul. It already has been. Uh, feels like a lifetime um but yeah it's like i'm not holding my breath for federal like legalization but i know um it would certainly serve as like a major legitimizing force for the industry do you guys think the california market in particular is going to be drastically different in the next several years or are it going to be more of the same it's ch it's changing dramatically every month i mean we have so many operators that have gone out of business we have so many retailers that have gotten gobbled up by larger uh conglomerates i mean it, it's literally every six months the competitive landscape change uh changes you know people drop off shelves people stop um you know manufacturing stopping cultivation i just saw a stat the other day you know at our peak california had eighty two thousand uh, million square feet of canopy we're now at about 62 million where it's a 20 percent drop um, 25 almost. And so, yeah, you're going to see a tightening of the wholesale market. And in turn, that's going to push up retail pricings. Hmm. I mean, that part's good. The, it's not good to see the small guys go out of business, but I do think that when there's oversupply, it kind of hurts everybody. So seeing that yeah. start to naturally even out a little bit, is probably a good thing, especially for you guys. Yeah, we're definitely seeing like we are, you know, grabbing a lot more shelf space on a weekly basis. You know, I think the biggest thing is just to figure out the AR situation, which, you know, we know Navis and Kiva are working on, you know, figuring out at least some sort of coalition to counter that. Um, and so being that they're the two biggest distributors, if they really put pressure and, and you know, align to put, you know, different protocols in place to avoid this i think that would really be beneficial for everyone because just mm. too many people have gotten away with it for so long and you know ultimately it's like they're gonna have to get on board or it's like they're not going to be able to have access to you know 85 percent of the brands in california yeah that's a good point what what has been your guys secret uh in such a competitive market to get your brand on the shelves um and grow them on the shelves like you're talking about especially with like, you know, obviously Old Pal has um, somewhat similar uh, sort of pouch, uh, pre-ground flower. Although I will say I, your flower is amazing. I had the best uh, like smoking experience since I was in high school with your uh, hash infused flower. So I can understand from that perspective, but um, what are you guys doing to kind of win the retailers over and trying a new brand and then building that shelf space? So I, um, I would say first and foremost, like, you know, 
for us being having our own farm and being able to truly see smell and smoke everything before it goes out to market is pivotal you know because there's a lot of brands especially value brands that are all white labeling from these super farms in santa barbara salinas and so us having our own cultivation really you know sets us apart from a lot of the value brands and then aside from that it's like you know we only put in you know ingredients you know that we will personally smoke and like both of us smoke a lot of stone roads so you know for us that's why we try and keep it like as natural as possible Possible. Like we don't ever infuse products with like distillate, botanical terpenes. Like we strictly, you know, infuse things with solventless bubble hash and, you know, now THCA diamonds for people who are really just leaning into these THC percentages. And then yeah. aside from that, I'd say like really just doing what we do best, you know, leaning into the SKUs that people like, and then, you know, being able to kind of like what Lex was saying earlier, increasing our capacity, because like for us, we found like we need to sell a batch within 90 days, especially because as people are becoming more keen on, you know, packaging dates, freshness dates. And, um, you know, so for that, it's like, you know, we are organically growing our batch sizes as the demand increases. But if we do see a skew kind of going backwards a little bit, it's like we're able to tailor that or, you know, fix that and without it having a huge impact, you know, on our product portfolio. And then like our branding, you know, we really keep it, you know, minimalistic, beautiful, you know, where we're, we like to say we're for all walks of life, but really branding for women and folks from the LGBTQ community and leaning into that. And, you know, like the other big thing I feel like really sets us apart is, you know, it's like when we bring a, a strain to market, especially like our infused strains, it's like we're pairing what flower goes best with which hash. And then with that, we come up with like these fun one-off strain names. We're not having these traditional strain names that everyone else has. Cause it's like, quite frankly, a retailer, they don't want three Northern lights on right. their menu, you know? So being able to like come up with something fun that's still in line, um, we mm -hmm. found like really people people really enjoy that yeah i remember like back when moon rocks were kind of big the guys that were really crushing it were the ones that were curating the uh complementary cultivars together not just slapping whatever they had um or at least that's what they were saying right so you could get that sort of combined flavor and, and experience so that's great how are you guys tracking kind of some of those metrics you're talking about i think a lot of brands struggle with that right like they don't necessarily know which of their products are have a good sell through and which products are lagging um, and then how to like kind of match production with demand, like what you guys are doing. So can you kind of walk me through that a little bit? Um, yeah. So for, you know, I feel like that's kind of where being a two person team really is advantageous because it's like, we're not tracking down, you know, all of our salespeople to gather that data on each of the account. We're both, you know, looking and examining every single account, we know what's selling good. And, and now we even have it dialed into like, we know which SKUs do best in which area of California. And a SKU that really just, you know, knocks it out of the park in SoCal might not be the winning SKU in Northern California. And so, you know, it is constantly fluctuating, but because also with Nabis, just having such robust data, we can see exactly which SKU is selling out in how many days. And so with that data, it's like, you know, we're able to then like for our next batch, you know, either increase it or decrease it. And for us, it's like, we, we do have small craft batches. We're never producing 20,000 of a, of a SKU at a time. So really being being able to like, you know, like meet the market where it's at as it continues to fluctuate, I would say is, is very helpful for us with, you know, like examining the metrics, but um, Lex definitely handles a lot more of the production side. So I'm sure he has some insights there as well. Honestly, so much of it is just like a gut feeling. Uh, obviously testing like plays a huge role uh, in, you know, the demand, um, that you're going to see, but we really don't track too much data. I think one, we're too cheap to subscribe to like headset or BDSA. Um, but ultimately it's like, we're just making products that we know the market is going to resonate with. Um, you know, for us, that means 
you know, as Sabrina alluded to, an interesting name, not just like a classic headband, but like, you know, smelling, smoking, really tasting the the flower to give it an app name that in, in, in kind of encapsulates the different, um, you know, notes that, you know, if you just smelled the flower. Um, and then, yeah, just making sure they're really potent and, you know, doing batch sizes that we, you know, aim to sell out in 90 days. And so, um, you know, everything's been moving really well. Um, and so um, it's just, you know, continuing to focus on, on quality over everything. Honestly, that's at the end of the day. It's like we're not bringing products to market to serve, you know, a niche consumer. We're bringing products to market to serve 99.9% of cannabis consumers. Hmm. So that actually does sound like you're using data uh, from Navis, which for those folks that aren't in California, um, can you kind of describe Navis and then their platform a little bit? Like, is it is it like a CRM or is it more of a sales data? So Navis operates as a 3PL, so a third-party logistics platform. So similar to the way that you take something to FedEx and then you have them do like the last mile uh, delivery. It's a similar thing where they store um, our products and then we just input an order and then they can simply pick pack the order and bring it to a final destination they do collections as well uh i would say that's one of the bigger weak spots of their business but um you know it's for us it's like it, it, it that model allows us to be intricately involved with not only the sales because it's literally us getting all the sales but also the ar you know for better or for worse it's like we have a call with them regularly to go over all the current status updates and um, you know, for us, it's like it's knowing the ins and outs of our business so that we're able to execute, um, you know, on our goals without having to, you know, bring in a specialty ops person, bring in a specialty salesperson. But we know basically the ins and outs of the business that we're operating. Their platform also does. So it tracks sales, AR, and then inventory as well. So like how Lex was saying, so, you know, they have a whole segment on there. So you can see like exactly which SKU, which batch, you know, how many. Inventory at the store level or inventory in their, their inventory? At their inventory. Mm -hmm. so, so, so Navis is inventory. Navis is inventory. Oh, okay. Yeah. They don't give you the insight to the store specifically. So you guys would have to know that from going out in the field and checking shelves and things like that. Yeah, but we've gotten a lot of our key retailers on, you know, our system of like, we just ask them to send us their Stone Road inventory inventory reports, whether it's a weekly or a bi-weekly basis. And so from there, we can see like what's sold, what's moving a bit slower. And then, you know, our favorite ones let us mock up orders, you know, how we yeah. see. And it's like with that, it's, you know, so many retailers are a little you know, hesitant about that because, you know, they are used to some people just like loading them up with a ton of inventory that isn't kind of moving. But it's like so many of our accounts trust us at this point and know that, you know, we're only gonna, you know, get them up to a par level that we agree upon. And like for us, you know, it would never make sense for us to like load someone up on certain SKUs because it's like we needed to sell it at their shop within 90 days as well, because we know otherwise we're gonna have to credit them, send promo units, all of this. And like that just becomes more work. So we'd rather tailor it and get it right. The first time and you know then like we're all on the same page and it's like once you build that trust and whatnot it's a lot easier to get new points of distribution meaning like new SKUs in their shop and and getting them to you know really also just like lean into your brand you know dedicate shelf space and all of that good stuff to you those are such great points and i i'm seeing more people start talking about partnerships with the the retailers instead of looking at them just as a transaction but like really uh how do you help each other succeed and kind of aligning those two uh, successes together i think is really important i also like the point about uh, managed inventory because like you said if you if you can gain the trust of them it gives you so much more insight and capability than if you're relying on kind of like a reactive approach um so kind of what I heard from you guys, I think, is yes, there is some uh, some technology leveraging that you guys have through your distributor. Uh, big focus on quality above all else. Uh, big focus on customer service and part, you know, being a, a good partner. And then sounds like something that I think a lot of brands really don't do 
And for you guys, maybe it's a little bit easier because you're small, but I still think larger sales teams can find a way to do this is making sure that the data collection is making it upstream to the people that need to make the decision. So they have those insights, right? So maybe mm -hmm. it's the salesperson that is in charge of that account actually going in with the, the sort of process like, hey, we need to know, do we have the shelf space that we need? Take some photos, um, you know, gather information on the sell-through rates of the SKUs or stuff that's lagging and not, and bringing that back so that the manager can make the same types of decisions you guys are able to make uh, sort of on the fly. Yeah. And even though we don't have any salespeople in California, like I created a whole sales process and that always has been one of my strong suits. And it's not, as you said, like a transactional process. It is about that relationship. And it's like, if you don't have that, it's like, you're only going to be able to grow it so far. And so in my whole sales process that I present to every sales team of every state we're in, it, it does go for exactly that. Like when you walk into a shop from like, you know, even just where you park in a shop, like if they have limited parking, it's like, don't take that front spot. You know what I mean? To like walking in the shop, make sure you're greeting everyone, security reception, and then like going in, examining like, you know, which of your SKUs are displayed, like which ones aren't displayed how you'd like it. And just yeah. really like, you know, uh, recognizing like the ins and outs and like all of these little things do make a difference within that relationship with that entire shop. And so, you know, those things are really important. And I think like, you know, some people it's like, I've gone on ride alongs with a lot of salespeople and it's like, they kind of just like go in and they beeline it for, you know, the buyer's office. And it's like, right. you know, you have to go look at the bud room. It's like, you know, their products might be hidden or, you know, you probably could get the bud tender to put you in a more prime placement if you're actually walking in and examining everything from like a high level and not just, you know, like getting that sale. Yeah, that's, and it's funny because other more established CBG markets, I think, do that exact stuff uh, much more, you know, effectively than probably cannabis is used to doing up to this point, which makes sense. I mean, back in the day, there was no shelf presence. You just give your trapper shop whatever you got and they sell it through a hole in the wall and <laughs> you call it a day, right? So, oh, back um, in the good old days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, before we move on to kind of the standard four questions, uh, what, in your opinion, separates, if you had to pick kind of one thing, what really separates the organizations and the teams that are successful in this industry from those that aren't? Oh, it's about being hands-on. I mean, if you have to hire someone for every job, it's like, you're going to have a super bloated payroll. As Sabrina was saying, payroll is the most expensive you know, aspect in any organization. I mean, Sabrina is my literally only full-time employee and, you know, a, a, a large percentage, uh, you know, between 30 and 40% of all the money that we spend on the brand side goes to paying, um, you know, people. And mm -hmm. so it's like, you need someone who can wear multiple hats. I mean, some days we're on farm tours, some days we're, you know, walking through manufacturing facilities. Other days we're, you know, pitching the brand to investors, we're pitching the brand to out-of-state partners, we're pitching the brand to, you know, buyers in the Central Valley. And it's, um, you know, you got to be able to do it all. Um, you know, all the people that I know who are running profitable, you know, enterprises um, and, you know, the, it, the, the CEO, the founders, the COO, the CFO, they're all working in tandem, but they're not only doing one job. Um, you know, everyone on our team is expected to do kind of whatever is done. And, you know, no person is too high up or too low to, um, you know, take on a new challenge. And, and ultimately it's the same in any industry, you know, it's like, you know, my, my, um, you know, my fiance is, a investor in, in, in companies that are massive, you know, hundred million billion dollar companies. And, um, you know, they always look to the CEO. Does the CEO know exactly what the business is doing? Is the CEO comfortable in the CFO role and the COO mm -hmm. role? You know, can they, can, if the COO goes out for maternity leave, right. can they step in and pick up? And it's like, if the answer is no, it's like, no, they're not going to invest. And it's like the same in cannabis. It's like, we're not going to partner with someone when we can tell, oh, they just, you know, got 15 million in investor dough, hired a bunch of suits and have no idea what business they're in. You know, it's like, you got to be on the ground. You got to work in multiple, you know, aspects of the industry. And ultimately you just have to be really shrewd. Mm -hmm. And, and that was 
those were all such great points. And I think one of the other things is, is having people whose heart is in cannabis, you know, like there are a lot of suits from other industries who come in just kind of looking at the financials and really like, you know, aren't even willing to learn like the differences in cannabis. Like I, you know, hear, see, and have experienced so many people coming from the alcohol industry and thinking that they can apply the same like sales, marketing tactics, distribution, everything to, you know, cannabis retailers um, or consumers. And, and a lot of the times it, sometimes it works and a lot of times it doesn't. And it's like having people who will get out in the trenches with you and like understand how cannabis is different. But I've, you know, worked with so many people where, you know, never once did they step out of the office and get on mm. the ground level and see what's actually going on and how it's different. And just think thinking like if they push, 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 you know, on something that was tried and true in another industry that it's bound to work in cannabis. And like we've seen over and over, there's so many times where it just, it does not work. Yeah. You can't compare an industry where distributors have exclusivity and then they have like, and then, you know, hundred times three, you know, a million times the number of retailers and they're not even limited by States and then try to say that's going to be identical to what we're dealing with because it is definitely and there's there's similarities business is business at the core but uh as you mentioned the nuances i think is what is lost on a lot of folks that come in and they just think that you know because they've done it in a different industry that they'll be able to figure it out the similarities are also slim you know most people think that there's like a natural connection between alcohol and cannabis there's really not um mm -hmm. you know from other than the fact that we look at it as both as vices but that's really exactly. it right besides the fact that they're both vice industries that you know can struggle to attract you know outside funding unless you're like one of the big four yeah. um you know it, it really like the distribution is different um the manufacturing is certainly different i mean like they don't even put like calories or like ingredients on a lot of like beer and wine and the yeah. testing is non-existent in alcohol and cannabis it's like you're working with nuclear waste the <laughs> the there's credit laws you know on the book for distributors if if you know a store doesn't pay for 30 days i mean they can get their alcohol license revoked it's like there's all these protections for that industry that don't exist right. in cannabis so thinking you're going to apply our expertise in alcohol into cannabis it's like no it's like i don't I don't grow oranges, you know, it's like, I, I just, because I grow cannabis, like I couldn't be able to go start growing citrus. I could learn, but I'm not going to know inherently. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point. That is a great plus. They don't have to deal with 280, which alone is kind of right. an enormous, uh, hang up. So, yeah. all right. Standard four questions. I ask everybody, uh, start with what is your favorite business book? Ray Ooh. Dalio's principles. Me too. Oh, that's a good one. I would say failing forward. Failing forward? Failing nice. forward. Why do you like that one? I like it because it really like for me, because I've worked in a in a few different startups and like, you know, there's there's always going to be like failures on a small and a large scale. And like changing my mindset from like it being a failure to learning from that and then applying that to your next business or just like pivoting a little bit really just like changed my mindset. And it's like now I kind of welcome failures because it's learning mm. opportunities. Builds that tenacity. Definitely exactly. crucial in this industry. Um, what is your favorite cannabis cultivar? Ooh. Besides our own. I uh, our own. <laughs> we grew a strain uh, the first two years that we've been unable to find called Pacific Frost. And it was probably the most beautiful, most delicious cannabis that I've ever seen. And we haven't been able to find the genetic again. It might be lost forever, but um, that oh. was my favorite. What was that? I, Do you know the cross on that one? Um, I have no idea. It was from uh, a group that's out of business now. It was from, uh, what was the big one that went out of business? Dark, Dark Heart. Heart. No, I didn't know Dark Heart went out of business. Good Lord. I know. I just learned that too. Yeah. I know. One time they were the biggest nursery in the state. Pretty crazy. Yeah, we used to get all of our genetics from them, uh, but it was always, I can uh, yeah, sort of yeah. see the writing on the wall in some senses. What about you, Sabrina? So, oh, that's, that's definitely a tough one, but I have to say probably Blueberry Muffin, which I think Humboldt Seed is... Yeah. 
they that's one of theirs and just I'm an indica dominant gal and that one is just so tasty smokes well every time so I'd say that's a tried and true favorite of mine it's a it's a good outdoor one too I feel like oh I'm a sun-grown girl (laughs) yeah yeah me too not a sun-grown girl (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um what uh interests and hobbies do you guys have besides cannabis oh i love to surf mm-hmm. where do you like to surf in la in new york in the harbor just <laughs> behind the big boats yeah <laughs> what specific beach oh in uh venice beach breakwater that's my okay. spot you ever go down to dana dana point uh when i lived in laguna beach i did but i haven't lived a drive in a while yeah, yeah. behind the orange curtain Yep. Sabrina? Oh, I have a lot of hobbies. Um, But I would say anything like with physical activities, I like to do a lot of hiking, yoga classes, Pilates. Those are definitely my my favorite pastimes. When you've got uh, year round 70 degree weather and sun, you kind of have to get out there and do that. Huh? Oh, yeah. I hike like five days a week. It's it's nice. Where's your favorite spot to hike? Probably Fryman Canyon in Studio City. I can get it done in 37 minutes. Easy, mm. easy, challenging enough, but it's it's a good one. Nice. Um, where can we find more about you guys? LinkedIn, Instagram, website, so on and so forth. And I'll put all the links all in of the, the above. Show notes, so yeah, we have a great Instagram, Stone Road Farms. We're also on TikTok, trying not to get banned. Uh, <laughs> we're both on LinkedIn. If you uh, have any questions, comments, uh, reach out to us. We'd be happy to chat. And go on our website, stoneroad.org. It's very fun. It's very interactive, different than any cannabis website I've seen. So definitely go check that out too. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, uh, guys, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure and uh, keep keep crushing it. Thanks, you too. Appreciate it.